Hi, and welcome to Healthy Kingston. This is the program of the Kingston Board of Health, and I'm your host, Janet Wade. Well, this is our last program for the year. I can't believe it. The time has certainly gone by fast. And what a year it has been, um, as certainly our public health nurse will be able to attest to between climate change and COVID and the flu and RSV. Uh, there's been a lot going on, and we'll certainly also be hearing about the refugee population that has been in town as well. So Kingston has been a very busy, active community. Um, first off, I would like to introduce our monthly guest, Leanne McGinnis, our public health nurse, and she's going to update all of us on what's been going on in the town uh, as regard COVID and uh, our general health. Leanne, thanks for being here. Thank you for having me, as always. Absolutely. Uh, my name is Leanne McGinnis. I'm the public health nurse for the town of Kingston. Um, currently, right now, we have 52 positive COVID reported cases within our community. Um, that is definitely an uptick. It has doubled since our last report two weeks ago. Um, that is said to be, you know, run very um, similar with an, in, an uptick of both flu and RSV. Um, so it's very important people are washing their hands. If you're sick, stay home. Um, just knowing the symptoms, any cold-like symptoms, obviously with hand washing comes vaccination. If um, making sure you're up to date with your most recent vaccine um, for COVID and flu. If anyone has any questions, just reach out um, through our website. We also have an active Facebook page, a BOH Kingston page, which also has information um, always being updated in regards to how to stay healthy and safe. Um, I do also want to let Kingston know um, this past uh, fall we had Janet and her students from Mass General who were very, um, very good with helping us get vaccines out, help the community with teaching and education both at Council on Aging, um, including our triad. Uh, meeting that includes both Council on Aging and Board of Health. Um, we had a guest speaker, um, our district attorney, uh, Mr. Cruz, so it was really nice that the students were able to um, attend those meetings. Uh, we've been very active at the Board of Health, making sure we're staying up with vaccines, doing homebound for people that need access for COVID vaccines. Um, also working closely with uh, Sue over at um, the shelter, which will be our next guest that Janet will have on, um, being able to be a resource and a friend to bounce things off of. Um, I will say that there will be, if you're interested, um, a community member also at a local church. It has um, set, reached out and they are selling bracelets. Um, it's a great resource to be able to give back. It's called Haiti 180. Um, and it will be on the Facebook page today. If you would like to purchase one, that is absolutely up to you. This is um, not an endorsement, but just a way to think of how to get back for the holidays. Um, Haiti 180 is a group of missionaries within our community that go out to Haiti. They provide food, resources, and their time, most importantly, um, to be of service of those um, in, in need. Thank you, Leanne. Yep. And uh, you've definitely been a, a gift to our town this past year and a half. Thank you so much for your services and happy holidays to you and your family. Absolutely. Just remember to stay healthy, stay safe. Um, up, the upcoming season will be tick time, tick time. so um, tick checks as soon as the weather does calm down. Um, just make sure you keep yourself um, healthy and absolutely happy. Thank you. Next, I'd like to introduce Sue Giovanetti, who is the Executive Director of Plymouth Area Coalition for the Homeless. And she has been the key person here in Kingston and uh, in working with the large influx of refugees and immigrants that we had come to our town as of October 19th of this past year. And there are 200 of them right now. Uh, about 20% of them are from the South Shore, and the rest are primarily from Haiti. But she's going to update us a little bit more on what's been going on there and uh, what we can possibly do as a community to continue to support her efforts and the states as well. So, Sue, thank you very much for being here. Thank you for having me and, and representing the coalition. Um, yeah, so we do. We have 200 uh, individuals, um, around 56 families as of today. 
a lot of children, um, young children, preschool children, um, a lot of activity, um, definitely very a very vibrant community that we that we currently have at the uh, Baymont uh, shelter. So, um, but when it comes to the reception that these families have received in our community, it's been nothing short of extraordinary. We've been really pleased. Uh, certainly what started off with some misunderstanding and some sentiment that we weren't necessarily uh, proud of uh, very quickly turned and uh, we, we couldn't be happier. Um, you know, the state of Massachusetts has taken, a, a, for many, many years, has been a right to shelter state. And as, as such, um, that put us in line to uh, be part of probably one of the most exceptional humanitarian efforts that we'll, uh, we've seen in our time. So to have that taking place right here in Kingston, uh, we have um, the families, yes, they, the, the refugee population predominantly is Haitian. However, there are so, some uh, program participants that are part of, um, I, I hail from other areas as well. Uh, what I would say is that to an individual, they've all been incredibly grateful, uh, as, as we see at Pilgrim's Hope Shelter on Route 80. Um, what I hope that the community realizes that it is a program, and when families come into an EA shelter, uh, there are goals and expectations that are set for each family. And so um, it's not just a matter of having housing. It's a matter of working with each family and helping them rebuild and so that then they can embrace um, a future that is self-sustainable. So we can, we work with them to identify housing and to find jobs. And they're, they're legal immigrants. Um, I'm sorry, they're refugees, but they have legal status. So um, they are well on their way to building a future just like our ancestors did, you know, years and years ago. Mm -hmm. And that's what we have to hold on to. So. Now, what departments in the state are you working with? So the Plymouth Area Coalition and has Pilgrim's Hope Shelter and now Baymont uh, Shelter, which are part of the Department of Housing and Community Development. We, we hold a contract with the department. And that is, um, that's what an EA shelter uh, runs from. So uh, the majority of our funding comes from that contract. And then, of course, then we have other programs and, and uh, we do other fundraising so that we can then build a strong, um, energized program. What are the services that they're being provided right now? Because I know at the beginning, the, the town was helping to feed the people that were there. There was an outpouring of help from the restaurants, from the churches. So in, in the early weeks, we had, um, we had several churches from the South Shore. Um, the, um, I won't remember the name of it, but it's the Area Council of Churches uh, came together and uh, they were helping both uh, the Plymouth Shelter and um, our shelter in, at the Baymont with uh, serving meals. Uh, we're transitioning that program now. Um, the majority of program participants have received their uh, SNAP benefits in uh, TAFDC. We're still working through as we receive new families. Uh, they, they'll need some assistance uh, because we're talking about families who have left great adversity. They have no money. Um, they've many have, have they've told us walked a month and a half on foot to cross the border and come and you know to find hope in uh, in Massachusetts. So uh, yes, it, the definitely the um, uh, the community was a large part of support helping us be, it, ensure that they did have the food and resources they needed. Um, we did transition three or four weeks ago to um, uh, catered uh, meals because it, it got, understandably, it got so that it was too much for uh, the folks that were helping us to, to continue to embrace. But um, 
people have just been wonderful. We can't say enough. And um, clothing-wise, we were able to provide everyone with either new or gently used clothing. Uh, they received winter coats. Um, shoes weren't quite as easy because of sizing. Um, but we've been able to really uh, help a great deal, and we never would have been able to do that if it weren't for the community support. And, and I will say, that goes definitely Kingston, but it went Kingston, Duxbury, Plymouth. It was large areas up to Hanover, uh, Rockland. We had someone drive in from New Bedford and drop off clothing for us. So um, it's, it's been very heartwarming and, and certainly appreciated. Now, the children uh, went through the whole process to get into schools, those who are eligible. So they're yeah, all yeah, I mean, and, and you know, I mean, I, we have, we have uh, probably a half dozen, maybe a few more in the elementary school, um, a handful in the high school, and a few in the middle and intermediate. Um, but they're, after the beginning of the new year, we'll be instituting a School on Wheels program so that there'll be tutors and mentors for the children, um, just as we do at Pilgrim's Hope. So once a week, the tutors will come in and help them. Um, and then we're moving forward with, with planning um, the education program for the adults as well, now that everyone has um, settled in and, mm -hmm. and, you know, they've been acclimated to the community. And health-wise, mm -hmm. I know there have been babies born, pregnancies. <laughs> yeah, you know, you take any 200 people, right? And, and right. the majority of them are young people, um, I would say up to... Um, you know, they're, they're 35, 6, and under the majority of them. So, yeah, there are a lot of young families, and with that is, you know. So medically, yes, we work very closely with Harbor Health. Leanne, certainly in the early days there, we were, ha we were really trying to field what was happening, and, and yourself, you were there um, just trying to do health assessments as families came in. Um, and that continues, you know, um, we're, we're trying to make sure that everyone has the um, medical attention that, that they rightly deserve. So going forward, mm -hmm. how long, do you have any idea how long they will be there? What is their future? What is the future you have for them? Is there any type of a plan worked out? You know, I, I think their, their future is very hopeful and certainly... Um, they, as legal immigrants, they are they uh, are entitled to um, all of the benefits that that we would be. They have to go through the immigration process, but they they're doing that. Um, they're trying to get driver's licenses, and um, so I think their future is very hopeful. Um, unfortunately, as we all know, affordable housing is rare um, to find. Um, so until we can get them out and, and working, um, that's going to be difficult. Um, home base, the state's home base program will certainly be there to support them, um, but first we have to be sure that they, they can, in fact, once they find housing, continue to sustain it. What is we as a community, what can we do? What, are, what, are, what is the need? I think, point. you know, I think going forward is to continue to embrace it in a very positive way, um, recognize that the learning curve, you know, it takes time to learn a new language. Um, there's, it, it, quite often people are, are step back a little bit when, when they meet someone that doesn't speak their language, um, and that makes it difficult for, for the population we're serving. Um, but I, I think just to continue what we've been doing. What we've been doing, um, we're making great headway. We do. I think the community deserves so much credit because we're a standout in in the way we've been able to uh, embrace the car the the situation. And um, I'm I, we've we've been able to address pretty much every facet of the needs of these families and we'll continue to do that. I think it's going to take some time until they can get jobs and we can identify housing. They're, they'll be happy to live anywhere. They're not necessarily looking to live right in this community. They want housing and a future for their family. Nice. 
and that's and I know I'm, I imagine there'd be people asking, well, what about the Haitian community? Have they kicked in here? And they definitely have. Oh, um, yeah. As far as food and interpreters and support for the people there, they've definitely we, offered their we, support. I, we have had, fortunately, we had already had relationships at the coalition with the Haitian community in the region. So we were able to put into place um, some, uh, some uh, I'll say programs, but we were able to get folks on hand in the shelter to, a, to be able to communicate and ease the transition for people um, because we already had those relationships. So, um, yes, we, we've had great support from the Haitians in the area and uh, we'll continue. We, we, every Friday we have an interpreter in. We have a DTA worker that's uh, with us twice a week. We have just hired on someone uh, from Four Families, which is a, a different agency who will be a Spanish-speaking uh, uh, staff member. Um, and we'll continue to do that. Certainly, anyone with a second language um, is going to be uh, desirable Very for desirable. us. And we're continuing to hire uh, staff as well. That's and if people speak Portuguese, that my understanding is um, a number of the people understand Portuguese. To a degree, I, it, it all depends. Not every one of them. Um, Spanish seems to be the easier mm -hmm. one. Um, Haitian Creole does have an element of French, but pretty much my understanding is that most of the younger population has a stronger Spanish background. Okay. Yeah. And we'll have uh, your name and your number um, up on the screen. So if there's anyone who has a second language ability who could work um, with the program. Um, it would behoove you, be wonderful if you could let Sue know. Um, otherwise, just keep us abreast and we can keep information on our webpage with the Board of Public Health if there's anything you need. Thank you. No, I, I thank you very much and, and thank you to the town because um, I think, um, as I said, I think it's a, the success of our program continues to be really a tribute to the community. So. Absolutely. Yep. Thank you, Sue, for all your good work. You've been tremendous. Sue has been there <laughs> literally morning, noon, and night. <laughs> so, pretty much. For weeks. <laughs> for weeks. Yeah, pretty so. much. But it's been, it's been wonderful, you. and it continues to be. So thank you. Thank you. Happy holidays. Yeah. Well, as we all know, the holiday season can be a lot of fun, but it can also be very stressful and overwhelming for a number of us. Uh, oftentimes, uh, we can become sad and uh, things that are losses that we've had during the year can become uh, more exacerbated. Uh, it's, it's a time of the year of a lot of emotions. And so I thought a perfect person to come in and speak with us uh, would be uh, Reverend Emily Bruce, who is the pastor of the Unitarian um, Universalist Church here in Kingston. And so, um, Reverend Emily, if you don't mind, I'll call you that. Thank you very much for being here. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell us what are some ways that people can manage stress during this holiday season? Yeah, thank you so much for having me on. Uh, the first thing I'll say is uh, admitting that it's a stressful time of year can be really helpful. A lot of people, you know, there's a lot of nostalgia around the holidays. There's a lot of um, desire to have the perfectly decorated home, the perfect Christmas cookies, the perfect meal, and nothing's perfect, including Christmas. So the first step people can take is just to admit that it's not going to be perfect and that's okay. Um, so I would say that's the first thing um, that I would advise people to do is give yourself permission to do what you can do and not do what you can't, can't do. do. Um, I'm a list maker, like a lot of people, so yeah. I would say make a list, prioritize it, and then give yourself permission to cross things off. Yeah. You don't have to do all the things. Um, and just taking those steps, I think, can really help make Christmas hopefully a little bit less stressful. stressful. And the other thing I'll say, which I say is an answer to so many questions, is just take a minute to breathe. Take like a couple minutes to take a few deep breaths. I literally did this in Target the other day. Mm -hmm. I stopped and I just took three deep breaths because I was having a moment of stress about getting all the perfect gifts and oh, they didn't have the thing I needed and where am I gonna find it? And 
I'm sure a lot of people have those thoughts too, so just literally stop and take three deep breaths. And that can work wonders to reduce the level of cortisol, which is the stress hormone in your bloodstream, slow down your heart rate, lower your blood pressure. And once you can calm down, everything seems a lot more possible. Yeah. So. No, yeah. I think you're absolutely right. I know with me, I'll, I'll be bombarded with, with several things. Like you said, you yeah. were. It's like, whoa, hold it, stop, wait a minute. Yeah. Yeah. Let's yeah. breathe and then prioritize. Exactly. One thing at a time. Exactly. So with all that said, um, how do you think we can create peace in our families? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm laughing because I'm thinking of mine. But anyway, peace in our families mm -hmm. and in our neighborhoods, our communities, uh, with our friends during this time. Mm. Um, I think one thing, and you touched on this a little bit in your um, introduction, is it's okay to be sad during the holidays. For so many people, myself included, the one time of year where I miss the people that I've lost the most, grandparents, and I have a cousin who's died, and I, I really feel that loss at Christmas. And it can be really tempting to push that away and push it aside so you can keep yourself busy and distracted. And that just creates more stress and more, um, I sometimes even resentment. So I would say it's okay to be sad, that grief is a part of of joy, of experiencing joy, of being a human being on this earth with and, and loving our family and friends. So allow yourself to be sad and it's okay. Um, I would also say that peace among family members especially, peace doesn't mean the absence of emotion. Peace doesn't mean not feeling. Peace means accepting. And a lot of times in our strive to have the perfect Christmas, other people fail to live up to our, our, our ideals and our needs around creating that perfect Christmas, and that's where a lot of family tension can start. Mm -hmm. So I would say, in addition to recognizing your own feelings, recognize that everyone else is struggling too. We're all doing our best. We really, really are. And so instead of letting someone's offhand comment or something else get to you, realize that they're struggling just as much as you are. And, and again, again with the deep breaths, and just have a little bit of compassion for yourself and for them. And that will hopefully diffuse a lot of the tension that can happen in families around the holidays. Good idea, yeah. good idea. Yeah. Um, what about family rules <laughs> for things you discuss or don't discuss? <laughs> 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 well, oh gosh. I mean, I'm not going to tell anyone that, it, that the holidays are a good time to take on uh, thorny topics in the family, right. especially around yeah. issues of politics and religion and right. everything else. Yeah. Um, but again, I would say, what's the purpose of the holiday season for you? Where do you find joy? And that's if you focus on that and especially focus on the gratitude you have, because we all are so blessed and I mean that in all the ways, not just in a religious way, but we are blessed with health and with people who love us and homes, hopefully, that we live in and, and passions that we, that we enjoy. And so if you can focus on the gratitude for what you do have and take the focus off what you feel like you don't have or are deserved, um, I think that can really help just reframe people's state of mind. Um, and that especially, I think, is very important around the holidays. So what brings you joy? What are you grateful for? And let that be the starting place for how you see the rest, how you see your family around you and the holiday season. That's beautiful. And yeah. I think that's a, a wonderful place to end. Mm. Um, yes, that we should all be grateful for what we have. Mm -hmm. Certainly thinking about these refugees who came to town with nothing. And yet um, we've been able to offer them things and that um, we have so much to give and uh, that we should be grateful for that. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for Thank your you. comments. Thank you. And breathe. When all else fails, breathe. Yes. Happy holidays. We'll see you next year.